thank you all for joining us. My name is Natalie Lazaroff and I'm the National Director of Marketing and Communications at the ZOA. I'd like to introduce you to the Chairman of ZOA's National Board of Directors, Mark Levinson, who will get us started. But first, I'd like to be the first to wish Mark a mazel tov to him and his family on the birth of a new grandson just last night. Mazel tov. Thank you. I'm, a, I'm in a very good mood. I, I now have a second grandson, so I'm very excited. So no one's going to be able to get me upset on this call. But I'm, uh, I'm actually very excited to, yeah, to be man. here. Um, Mort, uh, I'm going to do a couple things. I'm going to do what I was supposed to do, which was talk about ZOA for a minute, two minutes, three minutes. And then I actually, Mort was, as you all know, was supposed to be on this call. Uh, there's a very good reason he's not on this call. Uh, I can't really fully share it, but it's good news. He's doing something tremendous for ZOA, which um, uh, j literally came up, and it is probably one of the two things that, that we, we said that he would step out of this call for. So we're very, very excited about that. And it's, you know, he's obviously, he's the face of ZOA and he does critical work and there are a lot of critical things going on. So um, you're gonna get to see more of Floor, my good friend Floor, and you'll see a little bit of me. And then, uh, you know, we'll, uh, if you have questions for more that aren't addressed, we will address them here uh, and get them to him. Okay, so I wanna talk about ZOA a bit. Um, I want to really start by talking about a great program we had last night. Natalie was instrumental in that program. We had a young professionals uh, program. We've, we've kicked off and are starting a young professionals organization. We're very excited about it. And that segues to our recent tremendous effort that we had in the World Zionist Congress elections. Um, I'm delighted to see uh, our good friend, Raphael Cohen, who's actually on this, did not know he'd be on it. But he and Yaakov Agoel and the whole WZO, we had a tremendous cooperative uh, effort with the ZOA coalition, 27 of the best pro-Israel organizations in the United States. We had a tremendous result. And, and really out of that, we had so many of our young folks in that. It really ramped up our young professionals uh, committee effort. We had a tremendous program last night. It centered on Ellie Cohen, the, the late great spy for Israel, Ellie Cohen. We had two terrific speakers. Um, as an ex officio, I have the right to crash everything. So I crashed the Young Professionals program and it was fantastic. Apparently some other older folks also crashed because we had almost 200 people uh, on it. And it was a great, great start to a Young Professionals effort. And we're very, very excited about that. Um, we're excited also coming out of the World Zionist Congress effort. We have a new Russian division of ZOA, and we participated, co-sponsored, worked with them on a virtual Yom Hatzmut program that was held, I don't know, five, six, seven Sundays ago, where we had a tremendous um, uh, uh, outpouring of, of wonderful folks from the Russian community, we had folks from Israel, we had folks from, from the US, ZOA, and we're very, very excited about our uh, burgeoning relationship with the Russian community. Um, we have, uh, some of you may have noted, some of you may have seen um, about two weeks ago, I'm, I'm even forgetting time, maybe it's three weeks ago, Mort and I uh, hosted a webinar on some of the uh, issues and challenges we've been having, uh, you know, with, uh, the Conference of Presidents and Highest. Um, we, we, it's been well publicized, our efforts in that regard. And we thought that was a very, very useful program we had with, again, hundreds of people on the webinar. During this unfortunate period with the pandemic, which of course we all hope will be over you know, very soon, um, we had, we've had an incredible array of, of programs. We've had, I would think it's almost an event a day We've created a book of the month club, which has been very successful. We've had politicians on, we're gonna have more politicians on. We've had some tremendous folks from Israel. Um, Alan, if I'm, I don't know if it's TPA, TAP, the tremendous uh, press agency that does- TPS. Sorry, TPS. Uh, we, we, we actually met them at the end of our uh, recent uh, Israel trip. Uh, which Howard was so instrumental, Howard Katzoff was so instrumental in helping put together. And we met them there. They were a tremendous source for those of us who were so upset with the 
horrific media coverage on Israel, on us, on issues that are right of center, center right. It is just wonderful to see the work that they do. We fell in love with them when we met them in Israel. And then Mort and I actually met them back here in, in the States, literally, you know, a few days before the pandemic. And we've had, um, I, I've, we've had three programs with them, a series of three. Uh, and we're just very, very excited about the work and the things that we're doing. Coming out of the World Zionist Congress elections and efforts, as I hope everyone knows, for the first time ever, there's a 52% majority on the center, center right among the various uh, uh, organizations and entities that ran for positions. While the specific date of the Congress is yet to be determined um, because of the pandemic, we are so excited about the fact that we're going to have 52% of by delegates in the, in the World Zionist Congress and thereafter, and it's going to really help push the issues and, and initiatives that we're most concerned about. Acharon, Acharon, Chaviv, last but not least, I just want to mention a word. It may or may not come up today. I want to mention a word about what you'll see is a very strong effort and campaign by ZOA on the assertion of sovereignty um, in, in the Jordan Valley, uh, Yehud and Shomron, Judea and Samaria. This has been something that's been very, very close to the heart of Mort Klein, who is our beloved great leader, uh, and, and anyone that's been involved with ZOA. Uh, Liz Burney has done terrific, uh, uh, you know, incredible research and, and writing work on it. And we, uh, we believe very, very strongly, and have believed very strongly for many years, on, on, on the right of any Jew or any Israeli to live anywhere they want in Yehuda and Shomron. And although uh, it may not be the whole pie, uh, the combination of uh, the current administration in Washington and the current administration in Israel, we have a match that, you know, who knows uh, how long that will that match will end up being there for. Um, it has been accomplished the last couple of years with Yushalayim, the Golan Heights, the cutting of funding for the PLO. It goes on and on and on. It's a wish list we were so unbelievably blessed to have take place. We're very excited with the possibility on the assertion of sovereignty or the reapplication of sovereignty or the exercise of sovereignty by Israel. And so you're going to see a lot about our involvement in that. And we really hope it's going to be a very serious and significant campaign. Um, we are separately going to be raising some money for that. So if that's something that's of interest to you, you know, please um, contact Alan Jay, who's on this um, uh, Zoom call, myself, others. Um, we're very, very motivated, serious, and incentivized to push this campaign forward. We're very, very excited. I'm also excited, before I introduce Brian to introduce myself and Fleur, I'm also very excited to have as our, the co-panelist and the more important person on this call uh, that we're having today, the Deputy Mayor of Jerusalem, she'll be introduced by, by her good friend Brian, but I, I just want to say uh, two words about her, which are number one, she's been one of the star speakers at our mo two most recent COA VIP trips to Israel. We love her. We want. We told her she has to come back every year, and if she comes back next year and we give her a third ZOA pin, it creates a chazaka, and therefore she'll have to come every year thereafter. Okay, and that's going to be good because we see a very bright future for her on the Israeli political scene. And then secondarily, she's multi-talented. Everyone knows ZOA is kind of the closest thing to my heart besides my family. I, I do a couple other things in life. Uh, I also, for many years, have chaired the New Jersey Israel Trade Commission. I normally don't mix uh, uh, Parv and, and, and Bosar, Parv and Chalabi, but I must mention that we had a tremendous program on Sunday, which I chaired, that had to do with COVID-19, and Floor was kind enough to be uh, one of our main speakers from Israel. We had six Israeli companies that were presenting on fascinating, fascinating things on COVID. For those of us like myself, who were just worried that until we find a vaccine in 2021, what are we gonna do? To hear what some of these Israeli companies are doing from you know one second massive testing nasal sprays to working on peptic acids, which I don't even know what it is, but the interference of peptic acids and combining and then preventing them from helping to you know, make the match that creates the, the, the virus to um, you know, recombinant uh, items. I don't even know what recombinant means, but there were these six wonderful companies and that was just really a start. 
of what we see from Israel. So, you know, we sometimes in the political arena, we face a very, very tough battle when we advocate for Israel. We don't understand that. You don't understand it because our positions are correct. We're one Jewish state. We deserve to be there. We're entitled to be there. We've earned our place. We should have our place at the world table. And the unfettered anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism that we see out there, which is so frustrating to us, you know, on the COVID front, many of us had made jokes. Let's, let's all our enemies not take benefit of all the things that Israel will discover during this period of time. So anyway, I'm going to actually now segue over and, and introduce Brian. Brian was kind enough to help uh, arrange for this with Floor. And I want to say that uh, Brian Live rhymes with five, even though it's spelled L-E-I-B. Brian was one of our delegates for the ZOA coalition on the recent elections, which was really an instrumental part of our work uh, over the uh, time period leading up to and including the uh, the the uh, 10, eight, eight week period. And he also is a former national director of Americans Against Anti-Semitism. And he also was a formative congressional candidate uh, from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I'm not sure the last time a Republican was elected from there, but you know, we can always wish. So Brian, it's, I turn it over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. And uh, I think we'll all be holding our breath, uh, uh, before any Republicans ever elected in Philadelphia, but that's for another conversation. Uh, Mark, thank you very much for, for that opening statement, and, and thank you for your leadership as the chairman of the ZOA. Uh, and uh, we're going to, you know, get into a little bit about, you know, some of the work that the ZOA has been doing and, and really talk about an overall update on the status of Jerusalem right now. Uh, we're honored uh, to, to have Floor, the deputy mayor of Jerusalem, on the line with us. Uh, Floor grew up in Gibraltar. She studied law at King's College, London University. She qualified as a barrister in Middle Temple in 1997 and practiced in London before immigrating to Israel in 2001. In Israel, she worked at JDC in resource development for Europe and later became the executive director of Tikva a nonprofit organization saving abandoned and abused children from the former Soviet Union. In 2001, she set up her own communications consulting business, message experts, and does consulting work for large corporations as well as nonprofit organizations on effective communication strategies. In May of 2016, Floor became a city councilor in Jerusalem and in February of 2017, the leader of the opposition. In November of 2018, Floor was re-elected to the Jerusalem Municipal Council and was appointed Deputy Mayor for Foreign Relations, Economic Development, and Tourism for the City of Jerusalem. Floor is currently the only British politician in Israel and is involved in the advancement of women's rights and marginalized population groups in the city, in economic development, and also the fight for a touristic Jerusalem. Floor is a member of the Likud Central Committee. Floor, thank you so much for joining us on today's call. It's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you again. Mazel tov, Mark. Thank you, Floor. And, and now for a, a brief introduction on, on Mark. Great. Mark is the chairman of the Zionist Organization of America, and he's held that role now for two years. Uh, outside of the ZOA, Mark is the co-chair of the real estate department and chair of the Real Estate Transaction Practice Group at the law firm of Sills, Commas, and Gross, PC. Mr. Levinson also chairs the firm's Israel Business Practice Group. He's a member of the United States Commission for the Preservation of American Heritage Abroad, which he was appointed to that position by President Donald Trump. And Mr. Levinson, as he mentioned, also is the chairman of the New Jersey Israel Commission, appointed by the governor of New Jersey, Governor Murphy. Mr. Levinson is also a member of the leadership cabinet of the American Zionist Movement, AZM, and he is the vice president for New Jersey Israel Relations of the Orthodox Jewish Chamber of Commerce. He's a past president of the New Jersey State Association of Jewish Federations, and he also serves on the board of governors of Tel Aviv University and is a fellow of American College of Real Estate Lawyers. That is quite a resume, Mr. Levinson. Thank you for joining us. It just means I'm old. <laughs> so, <laughs> without further ado, 
we're going to jump right into some Q and A here for for everyone on the line. The way this is going to work, uh, I'm going to be asking questions uh, of Thor and of Mark, and and some will be tailored to the both of them. And then at the end of the call, we uh, we're going to have a live Q and A session for the individuals on the call here. You can ask a question by hitting the raise your hand button on the bottom of your screen here. And we will do our very best to, to try and have all your questions answered, but we probably won't be able to, but we'll, we'll definitely try and do our best. So without further ado, and actually let me back up for a second. I wanna say thank you to, to, to Natalie, thank you to Alan, to Moore, to Mark, to everyone at ZOA for allowing me to, to moderate this, this panel, but more importantly, for the work that, that all of you have been doing as, as staff members and lay leadership for, in my opinion, the strongest pro-Israel group in this country. This DOA stands unequivocally with the state of Israel in fighting for Zionism and fighting against anti-Semitism. There's not a lot of Jewish organizations in today's world that fight the way ZOA fights, and all of you should be applauded for that. So thank you. So let's jump right into it. Floor, the first question is going to be for you. Over the last couple of years, the number of international tourists that have been visiting Israel has grown substantially. In 2019, over 4.5 million tourists visited Israel, and tourism has now become a major part of Israel's economy. Can you tell us a little bit more about why tourism to Jerusalem has grown, and what's your post-corona uh, virus forecast looking like for the city? Okay, thank you, Brian, and thank you very much for the initiative and for organizing, and thank you to the ZOA. Um, Jerusalem has had an unprecedented amount of tourists within the last few years. We can actually safely say that in the last two years, we've had 10 million tourists. Now, it doesn't sound like a lot when you think about the US and tourism, but when you think about 10 years ago, we barely had over a million tourists. And so we've grown almost fivefold in 10 years, which remember Israel and especially Jerusalem with the image of you know, perhaps an unsafe city, which is completely false. And this is, this is the fallback, but we've been growing steadily for the last 10 years and it's amazing. What's really interesting is that 30% of Jerusalem's economy is based on the income coming from tourism. So whether directly or indirectly, many of the business in the city are, um, are fed and have their main income coming from tourism, which actually means that in the last three months, um, the complete lack of tourism because of the coronavirus has been completely devastating to the city. Um, and we are now figuring out how to recover. So I just this week, I just set up a, um, a municipal committee um, to try and figure out how to get out of the crisis of tourism today. And in the first stage, what we decided is that we have to encourage local tourism. Now, you have four and a half million Israelis who go out of the country every summer, which is crazy when you think that it's a country of eight and a half million people, that half the country fly out during the summer. Now, this summer, they're not going to be flying anywhere. So at the moment, I'm leading a strategy to try and encourage Israelis to come and actually get to know Jerusalem. Many Israelis also have a different image of Jerusalem to what Jerusalem really is. And so at the moment, in the first stage, we're launching a local tourism campaign. And in the second stage, we're preparing for what post-corona tourism looks like. And I think that with the innovation that we have in our city, uh, with the startup nation is very much alive and well in Jerusalem. And so with the innovation that we can come up with, we can figure out new ways of dealing with post-corona tourism. And by that, I mean, more the boutique experience. Um, you know, you can have applications that limit numbers. You can have applications. I, I met somebody last week with an, with an app to check into a hotel, even the keys on the app. So there's many things that we can do with the ingenuity that we have here in Jerusalem uh, to figure out how to keep tourism when the skies open up, when the tourists come back, to make people feel safe. I think the most important thing at the moment is to restore confidence in travelers. And we, we, I, I believe that we can position Jerusalem to be the post-corona model city for how tourism is done, for people to feel safe um, 
uh, to come and travel and to come to Jerusalem first. What do you think is, uh, I mean, this might be a loaded question for, but what is the secret sauce for, for Jerusalem? What, what, what keeps bringing people back uh, over and over and over again uh, to Jerusalem in particular? Well, I, look, I think that uh, Jerusalem, there's only one Jerusalem. Uh, and, you know, to have a city which is both ancient, you know, has 3,000, 4,000 years of things to see, archaeological sites, um, but at the same time, a very present, vibrant city with an incredible culinary scene because of our diversity and also the city of the future. The way I see Jerusalem and the way I try and market Jerusalem is a, 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 we're a city of convergence. We converge the old with the new, the past with the present, and heaven and earth. And I think that creates a very special source of diversity and contrast that people really fall in love with. It's just a question of getting people in our city. Once they come to our city, I'm not worried about their experience. It's just getting them here. Well said, uh, well said. Uh, you know, ZOA has played a major role, Mark, in, in helping to, to bring groups, uh, you know, to Israel for, for many, many years. Uh, and, and especially to places, Mark, where other uh, Israel, pro-Israel and Jewish organizations would steer clear of Lake Judea and Samaria. Uh, Mark, could you tell us a little bit about some of the trips that ZOA has to Israel in a typical non-coronavirus year? Uh, and yeah. really, what makes the goal uh, of the ZOA mission trips so different than the countless other missions happening uh, to Israel? Well, well, Brian, you actually just gave the answer in your question, so I could just say, listen to what Brian said. But the reality- Brian, make it easy for you, Mark. Yeah, we, have, we have, in a typical non-corona year, we have two campus mission trips. Uh, Natalie actually uh, was, was staff on one of our recent ones. We have two terrific campus trips. We have a terrific campus leadership group. Jonathan Ginsburg is in charge of that. We have, uh, in, in, in non-corona years, we'll have, five uh, campus staff that, that cover the U.S. And um, we have a very generous uh, contributor who has been helping to fund that program for years because he believes in the importance of it. And so we have a great, great trip to Israel for the campus uh, kids twice a year. And then we have our annual ZOA VIP solidarity mission uh, uh, in the end of February, which uh, the last two years has been spectacular. And what really distinguishes our trips. We do meet with politicians. We meet with Flora. We meet with the mayor. We have a lot of close friends in the Knesset, uh, especially because of our policy, our principles and, and our, our policy views. We have a lot of good friends in government. We have really pretty much entree everywhere we go. But we don't, we don't sell our trips to Israel on our political connections of those meetings, which are really terrific, by the way. And, and frankly, our friends at uh, Worldly could help us with that uh, as well. But what we really sell our trips on is that we spend a significant portion of the trips in, in Yehud and Shomro. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, and I really say that because I've been involved in Jewish stuff and Israel advocacy for many, many years, it is incredibly disappointing how few Jewish groups, including those who consider themselves center of right or right, how few groups will spend significant times with really the most almost most important Jews in Israel, those that are the pioneers that are you know, living and building out Yehuda and Shomro. And we spent significant time there. Uh, and we've had, th th this trip in particular this year was unbelievable. We, we had so many stops, we run late from each and every one. We're seeing new communities that are being developed. We're seeing, one of the, uh, the last stop where we actually met, met TPS, you're seeing towns growing out of, you know, a, a couple of uh, folks, I don't even like the word settle, I don't like the word settlements. A couple of folks will go out to an area and, and they'll live there as, as really like pioneers and then a few more will join them. And before you know it, you have a couple hundred people there. I'm, I'm really bad with some of the names, but one of the, the towns maybe Howard can remember that we visited this year and we were in a beautiful, beautiful apartment that, that overlooked uh, a, a, a wonderful Vista area. And when we came out to get a tour, we saw literally like a hundred kids' bicycles 
just kind of sitting there in the middle of, of the cement, you know, uh, entrance area to the complex. And I'm sitting there and I'm looking at these hundreds of bicycles. And then from my, that's one vantage point. From another vantage point, I see these multiple school buses pulling up because school had just ended. And you see, you know, hundreds of these gorgeous little Israeli kids, school kids coming out of the school bus. It just, you know, makes your heart melt. It makes, you know, the, the emotion. And, 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 and I look there and I'm seeing all these kids and all these bicycles. And I'm saying to myself, there are more Israeli kids in this one complex and more bicycles than if I go to God knows how many communities in America that had once had great community. And, you know, all those things. So, it, it, you know, it, it's, it's those type of areas that people don't get to see that ZOA, we, we, we show them. We show them, frankly, and I'm sorry to say this, but we show really some of the destruction that goes on, some of the destruction that goes on by, by the Arabs and even the Bedouins, how, you know, Israel is blamed and tagged for doing anything wrong, and yet, you know, we, Israel can't even control what, you know, other el elements in, in society in Israel do. Um, we obviously have a lot of, you know, fun uh, touring trips and aspects. Um, and it's really, it's, it's, it's a wonderful trip. We go from morning till night. We do have, uh, you know, political speakers every day and it's a lot of fun, but really what I say is the important part of what we do. We show them the people and, and the land of the Yehud and Shomron and Ariel and Gush Etzion and all those areas. And, and, and people say that they, you know, they've not been there before and, and other groups don't take them there. And we're not only not afraid, we're happy to do it. We're so happy to do it. So that's really, uh, I, I think last year, Howard, correct me if I'm wrong, I think last year we went to the Tachina factory near Shechem and, and, you know, that was a mind blowing experience. It's, a, it's a, one of the largest Tachina producers in, in, in the world. And it's by this kind of uh, sect that's, you know, kind of Sumerian, uh, I think it's Sumerian sect. And, and, you know, they are kind of in the middle between, you know, Arabs and Jews and, you know, to hear their story and, 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 and what they go through, you know, was amazing. And while we're there, we were actually seeing Kerry Yosef. We're right there seeing Kerry Yosef. And, and these are things, you know, you just don't see if you're going to a, to a tour that basically is spending the day in Tel Aviv and, and a lot and, you know, in a few hours in Yerushalayim. So uh, that's what I would say is special about our ZOA trips. Yeah, I, I, uh, I can't wait to, to go on one of those, hopefully, uh, in the near future, post-corona. Uh, next February, will, uh, baby, next February. I, I can't wait. Uh, absolutely can't wait. And, you know, while we're, we're talking about going to Israel, this is a question that I would love to, to pose to the both of you. Uh, you know, with, with regards to, you know, how everything seems to be changing on a minute-by-minute, week-by-week, day-by-day basis, uh, you know, let's start with you for – how do you see tourism for Israel, you know, changing, you know, both in the, you know, hopeful aftermath of coronavirus and, and also taking into account uh, what's hopefully potentially going to be happening in July uh, with regards to sovereignty? Um, look, I think that it's very difficult to predict right now what's going to happen with the corona because Israel three weeks ago, two weeks ago, uh, we were pretty sure that the numbers were going down and the disease was disappearing, and we've just had a spike in the last couple of weeks. Schools closing, uh, people asked, uh, we were going to be extending public gatherings from 50 to 100, now we've gone back to 50. Um, and so I, I honestly think it's very difficult to predict. I would love to say that by the Chagim, uh, you know, by the high holidays, things would be back to normal, but I'm not even sure about that anymore. So I think we're just trying to, what we're trying to do in Jerusalem is certainly plan for the day after Corona, plan, like I said earlier, to restore the confidence of travelers um, and, and, and just focusing at the moment on developing that type of infrastructure. But of course, you know, like I said, it's devastating to our economy because our tourism is not just travelers. We have, of course, groups like yours. We have educational tourism. We have business tourism. We have uh, gap year students, high schoolers. We have so much uh, going on in Jerusalem and everything has just, you know, totally stopped. I mean, I just read just now that last year in May, we had 350,000 visitors to Jerusalem. 
and this year we had 3,000. And so it's, I, we're just trying to get through this at the moment and hopefully we'll come out better at the end. I'm trying to help pull together a business uh, fund for grants for small businesses to give them some oxygen to get through this time. We're trying to take as many businesses as we can online. Uh, we've created a, a shopping mall, a virtual shopping mall for Jerusalem businesses. And so we're really doing everything that we can to try and breathe some life into the, the small businesses of the city that are mainly supported by tourism. So I really don't know, but what I do know is that we're gonna prepare for the day after from now. Um, we have a lot to organize. Uh, we have so many sites in Jerusalem. And I think the problem with Jerusalem is that there's too much going on. And so what we're gonna try and do is organize ourselves packages, categorizations, better maps, uh, better facilities to be able to understand what's available. Um, and at the same time, we continue to build hotels because we need more hotel rooms in the city. And look, it, at the end of the day, Jerusalem is the holy city. Um, and everybody who comes, 80, 90% of the visitors who come to Israel come to Jerusalem. So people will come back to Jerusalem. The question is how many, at what rate, and how much is going to affect our economy in the meantime. So I would, Brian, I, I would just add, I, I, I share what Flora says, and, and, and unfortunately, uh, you know, I kind of share her views when, when the whole COVID started, Corona started, you know, people assumed, oh, by summer we'll be fine, you know, fall will be fine. It's, um, you know, I have, I have, thank God, much of our family is, lives in Israel, and, I, you know, we get, like everyone with the WhatsApp, we, we, get, we get the daily, if not more, updates, and already there's a little bit of a fear in some of the schools of, of, of the second surge, despite the great job that Israel did leading the way. Uh, you know, and kind of locking down quickly and, and trying to flatten the curve. And, you know, as an organization, ZOA's organization, like many nonprofits, you know, it is a challenge. Um, we had to cancel, regrettably, but obviously of necessity, we had to cancel our Washington mission, which really is one of the highlights of, of the ZOA year. Between the Israel trip in February and, the, and our annual dinner, our, our Washington mission, which last year we turned into a day and a half, and we're looking to build upon that. Um, you know, we have you know congressmen and congresswomen and senators, you know, just lining up to speak to ZOA and, and all the issues. But we had to cancel that. We're going to do some virtual, uh, you know, programming in lieu of that. But you know, nothing replaces you know, ZOA sitting there in a, in a, in a, in a conference room, a large conference room in, in, the, in the Senate uh, office building, Russell office building, and having, you know, the most important politicians, uh, you know, in, in Congress coming to talk to us, and, and many of whom share our views. And it's so wonderful to hear. But we had to cancel that. Um, you know, we had to cancel our uh, campus uh, trip for Israel this summer. Um, mm -hmm. Candidly, we're, we're likely going to move the dinner uh, which was scheduled to take place, our annual gala, that's going to likely be moved out of, you know, near the end of, of, of 2020. We'll move it into 2021. We're still going to have it, and as relatively early in the year as we can, but there are very serious challenges, and, um, you know, there's no, no two ways about it. The best that we can do is what we're doing. We're, we, our staff works hard. We, we, you know, do a lot of the virtual programming, um, you know, we obviously do a lot of stuff with Israel and, you know, anything that we can do to help Israel, ZOA is going to do, but nothing's going to be as good as stepping, you know, back onto the streets of Jerusalem, which, you know, we are hopeful, we are hopeful that in, you know, early first quarter, mid first quarter in 2021, we'll be able to do. Well, with, with Flora at the helm uh, running uh, tourism uh, in Jerusalem, I think we, we all feel pretty confident that uh, it's not a matter of, uh, uh, of if Israel and Jerusalem will bounce back. It's just a matter of when. Um, and, you know, Mark, you just mentioned, you know, some of the access that ZOA, you know, provides to some very important politicians. And, and I think it's a good segue into, uh, into the next question here for Flora you know, unquestionably one of the most important politicians, uh, especially with regards to the U.S. and Israel alliance, uh, has been President Donald Trump. 
Uh, President Trump has stood unequivocally with the state of Israel uh, from moving the embassy to Jerusalem, recognizing Jerusalem as Israel's eternal capital, recognizing Israel's sovereignty in the Golan Heights. Uh, the list goes on and on and on. And, you know, building a floor, building in eastern Jerusalem, I think has been growing quite a bit under President Donald Trump. Can you tell us a little bit more about the future of additional building in, in, in eastern Jerusalem and what that, that landscape might look like? Please. Yes, absolutely. I mean, look, um, I think the best thing that has happened to Jerusalem and of course to the state of Israel is the recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of the state of Israel and moving the embassy. Um, it's been great morally and I truly believe it's going to be great economically for the city and I'll explain why. Um, this recognition is not only bringing with it a massive half a billion dollar um, new embassy, that is going to be built in actually a neighborhood very near where I live, um, which will actually, you know, there's something called the embassy effect, which is when you build a big embassy like the American embassy anywhere, the whole neighborhood is kind of lifted economically, socioeconomically. Um, and so first of all, we're just very excited for the city to have such a, a huge project like this happening. You know, the, the, the US embassy employs 800 people and so to have such a, a big sort of anchor of recognition in our city, in the south part of our city, um, will bring enormous economic uh, opportunity. Um, and, but but the, 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 the second thing that is brought, which is more important even, is the fact that because now East Jerusalem is recognized as part of one city, which of course we knew, but has not been recognized internationally, what that allows us to do is actually bring the Americans in to helping us develop East Jerusalem. And I'm very close to the um, David Friedman staff uh, and people, they're all wonderful people. And together we're trying to find a way of bringing economic opportunity to East Jerusalem, mainly to the Arab population there. Because of course, the more development you bring, the more likely we are to keep our one united city forever. Uh, as we know, it's our eternal capital. And so the, um, the Trump administration is actually very interesting, interested in normalizing uh, Israel and Jerusalem especially with the region, with the Middle East and the Gulf states. And I actually see, and I presented to them, that East Jerusalem can be a key in this normalization because we can't get away from the fact that 37% of the population of Jerusalem are Arabs. Um, and so we, I believe that m most of the Arabs in East Jerusalem when President Trump uh, came out with his deal of the century and 90% uh, of East Jerusalem is to stay as a united city with Jerusalem, the people who actually breathed the biggest sigh of relief were the, were the Arabs in East Jerusalem because they have understood for a while now that the salvation is not coming from the bankrupt mafia leadership of the Palestinian Authority. And so they're very, very happy to stay as one united city and what we have to do is ensure that there's equal opportunity for the Arabs of East Jerusalem because it's in our interest and it's in the interest of a united city and the Americans to me have been absolutely crucial in this um, so there's been building also for Arabs also for Jews in East Jerusalem and they will continue to be building yesterday the mayor announced that we're building a huge high-tech park we're calling it Silicon Wadi and there's gonna be a huge high-tech park in East Jerusalem. It's going to provide 200,000 meters of office space, 50,000 meters of hotel space, uh, which will obviously be more affordable and, and more commercial centers. And what we're aiming to do is bring 10,000 jobs to East Jerusalem, again, to strengthen the city, to strengthen all populations of the city, and ultimately to keep one united capital city for the state of Israel which is our eternal and undivided capital, Jerusalem. And so I think that uh, President Trump's vision has been absolutely, absolutely spot on with what needed to be done, especially with my city, with Jerusalem. Um, look, we couldn't have asked for a better president. I think that sometimes you need somebody who's an out of the box type of personality like President Trump to shake up uh, paradigms that people have just gotten used to for so many years. And you needed somebody like Trump to come and just shake it up. 
and that's what he's done. Um, and you know, creating the facts on the ground, which is hopefully what we're going to do with asserting our sovereignty in the Jordan Valley in Judea and Samaria, um, is only going to bring us uh, in a better position. We cannot uh, negotiate with a Palestinian leadership which is divided into five because nobody on the Palestinian side can deliver peace. And so it's dangerous and suicidal for us to try at this point to do anything but uh, put facts on the ground and do what's good for our country um, and, and, and assert sovereignty. And so we couldn't have asked for a better partner uh, than the Trump administration. And I can only speak wonderful things about Ambassador Friedman. Ambassador Friedman really gets it. Uh, and he's here and very present on the ground. Uh, people really love him, appreciate him, and he's doing wonderful things for all parts of Jerusalem. That's, uh, oh, I, that's a beautiful message, Mark. I'm sorry. Yeah, so I, I, I want to uh, comment to uh, basically agree with everything Flora said and, and kind of add, add something on all those. Uh, first of all, on the Jerusalem, East Jerusalem front, you know, we, we ZOA, we've had conversations with Flora when we were there. And what I especially like about Floor, aside from all her talents and everything else, is many of the politicians, both in America but also in Israel, will certainly talk certain things. If they're talking with ZOA, they'll agree with ZOA. If they're talking with some other organization, she is committed, really committed, to really building out parts of, we'll call it East Jerusalem, but parts of Jerusalem as a whole. She's committed to that. And that what is, is incredibly important. And that really has been what's so important about the president. Uh, on the matters relating to Israel, people have talked a good game for a long time. We know for how many years people talked about moving the embassy in Jerusalem. And Donald Trump did it. And, and there were many talking heads and pundits that talked about, uh, you know, the world was going to burn down if we moved the embassy. And President Trump did it. And President Trump did what he said he was going to do. And, you know, Floor, when we talk to her about some of these issues in, in Yerushalayim, she's exactly where ZOA would, would want to be on those issues. Um, I'll, I'll comment also on, on David Friedman, Ambassador David Friedman, incredible individual. Um, you don't often, uh, he actually was a year ahead of me in, in, in law school and, and was really, uh, used to daven mincha uh, sometimes in the office of uh, one of the bankruptcy professors on, on the third floor. Um, you, you rarely find someone in public life uh, and out front on issues like David Friedman is. You really find someone who is so grounded and who really has his ego in such complete check as, as David Friedman does. He is one of the few people you'll see he doesn't look to grab glory for himself. He always is willing to, you know, deflect to others. But, but I can tell you that he is such an important linchpin for what's been accomplished during the Trump administration. And, and you know, a lot of people make jokes, a lot of people make comments about lots of things you know, involving the Trump administration. The president had worked for years with David Friedman and you know, well before he was in politics. And he knew exactly what talented lawyer and individual this person was. And you know, what David Friedman, Ambassador David Friedman has accomplished you know, for, for the United States, for Israel, for world jewelry, you can't even begin to count. The Dianos go on pretty long. And you know, I hope he'll be there for a long time. Um, I, I well know, as some others here do, there are other things that are potentially on the agenda and the horizon going forward. And you know, we got a beautiful team there. And but we also can't lose sight of the fact that we've been blessed. Obviously, everything comes from above, but we've been blessed with the team in Washington and the team in Jerusalem. And we can't take it for granted. You know, a couple of years ago in December, coming out of the previous administration, there was nothing that was more damaging and dangerous to Israel and Jews worldwide than Resolution 2334. Who could have ever comprehended that a, 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 an administration in the United States would basically stand by and not veto 2334? People don't realize how dangerous and damaging that resolution was. And, and, and thank God and thank goodness this current administration has done everything possible to kind of move that aside and move forward. But, you know, mm -hmm. we'd be silly to think if there's going to be Donald Trump there for the next, you know, 20 years. It's not going to happen. There'll be other administrations in the future. 
And we really have to support, if, if you're a believer in Israel and the issues that we're concerned about, like sovereignty, undivided Yushalayim, the rights of Jews to live everywhere, zero tolerance for anti-Semitism, then you have to be out there and be supportive. To sit there and nitpick on this, that, and the other, you know, you can do that till the cows come home. I don't think we'll ever see the kind of opportunity we have now. And we believe very strongly we should take advantage of it. Well said. I, I, I think, uh, you know, we're all in agreement that, you know, for, for the pro-Israel crowd, this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. It's a once-in-a-lifetime president uh, and also a once-in-a-lifetime administration from David Freeman to Jason Greenblatt to Avi Berkowitz to everyone. They're just fantastic. Uh, I, I want to ask one last question here before we open it up for Q&A. And Mark, I'd like to ask you first, uh, you know, with July quickly approaching, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's announcement to formally apply sovereignty in Judea Samaria is a topic that has all of Israel buzzing uh, and everyone outside of Israel, both pro and anti-Israel buzzing as well. Mark, can, can you tell uh, you know me and Flora and everyone on the line a little bit more about what ZOA's position is on this expected move by the Prime Minister? Please. Yeah, so ZOA, and again, Mort, I'm, 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 I'm stepping in here for Mort. Mort is our, you know, our leader and spokesman on these issues. He formulates, he's a prime architect. We talk about these things every day, talk early in the morning, late at night, middle of the day, multiple times. But Mort really is the architect, and he's got the golden Rolodex, and, you know, he kind of lays it out. But our basic principles are this. And I will say, as I lay out our basic principles, we actually have uh, a, a new head of our Israel office, Dan Alouz. Uh, we're stuck in the pandemic, but you're going to, some of you may know Dan already. And, um, you know, he'll, he'll be out there for us and he's going to be helping us on the ground in Israel because his campaign for sovereignty is not just a campaign in Israel, in, in the U.S. Uh, we will have this campaign. I talked about it at the head of uh, of our discussion here. And we also, you know, ZOA will be out there, uh, you know, in Israel with our Israel office, and we will be laying out the groundwork for our views on, on, on this plan. Uh, we were very public when the Trump uh, deal of the century, the peace plan came out. Uh, and if any of you want it, Natalie will, will get it for you. We, we gave a very detailed uh, release, which went through I think it was 31 reasons or, 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 or positions on the plan that we were in favor of and supported. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to say that every last item in the plan we're, you know, 100% on board with. I mean, there are things we may not, if you have followed ZOA, if you followed more for the last 27 years, there might be things in the plan that we might not be 100% for. But again, as we, we've articulated, we're in a situation right now where we have the administration we have in Washington, the administration we have in Israel. And I think woe, woe to us if we don't jump on this and help support this strongly and, and get it done, we won't have an opportunity like this. And our hope is that BB comes out, you know, out of the gate with this early in July as possible. We think every day that passes by is a day that's passed by and is a day that's lost. We should come out, the government of Israel should come out as soon in July as possible on it, and ZOA will be there. And I guarantee you, not only will ZOA be there, you'll see that others won't be there with ZOA and won't be there with the government of Israel and won't be there with, with the government of the United States. And you're going to see a lot of hand-wringing and, and, and shrieking, and you're going to hear people talking about the world burning down. And, you know, it just isn't true. It just isn't true. So they I'm said the about. same thing when the Americans moved the embassy. They said it was going to be another intifada. It's going to be a revolution. Here we are two years later. Nothing's happening. So that's my view. That's Flora's view. I do want to say before you, we open it up to Q&A, I think you should ask Flora to tell the group here a little bit about her wonderful political entry into this position. Because I know the story, but I think others will want to hear it as well because where she is now is not where she was a couple of years ago as the campaign was happening. She's got an amazing, amazing background. And I think we should hear some of that floor. How far I, back do you want me to go, Mark? <laughs> uh, well, I will leave it to Brian. Okay, Brian. Well, you know, I, I have to tell you, Mark, that was one of the questions that I had here for, for uh, you know, certainly to, to talk about, you know, her 
her political uh, background. And of course, you know, Flora, you're, I think, uh, speaking for myself here, I view you as one of the most influential female leaders of Israel present day and, and certainly for the future. You know, so, you know, the question has to be asked. You don't have to answer it. But I mean, you know, what are your plans for the future? You know, will you run for a higher office? And also, you know, please tell tell the group a little bit more. How did you get into politics uh, in Israel? Uh, well, I moved to Israel 19 years ago. Um, I'm originally from Gibraltar. Uh, I studied law. I'm also a lawyer, studied law in London. Um, my father was a politician in Gibraltar. He was actually the prime minister. Gibraltar is a small place and it was a British colony, and my father and a few of his friends created a movement to, uh, to get self-determination for the people. And so they created the first city council, and he was the first mayor, and then they developed a constitution, and then he was the first prime minister. So I come from a political home, and I always say anybody who gets into politics has to be either somebody who saw it at home or a little bit crazy. So I think I'm a bit of both. Um, but I grew up, I grew up with, a, with, a, with a very strong sense of public service and seeing my father work very, very hard for, for the people that he represented. And I guess you do what you know. And um, when I moved to Israel, I was busy trying to learn Hebrew. I really didn't think about a political career. I was a nonprofit, as you mentioned, Brian, for many, many years. I, didn't, I decided not to practice law in Israel. So I went straight into nonprofit. And then as a communications consultant, I, I was in fact asked to help a political party with their political messaging. And that's how I originally got involved. And it was a party who, that was actually very center, uh, middle of the road, there were left-wing people and right-wing people. And I actually enjoyed the fact that we could find uh, common ground in, in doing something good for the city. Um, eventually, I, I, I ran for office a second time as the uh, number two, as the running mate to a Likud minister, Zev Elkin, who was the Jerusalem Affairs Minister. And in fact, he was the guy who decided that we need to invest in East Jerusalem. Uh, you know, because for, for many years, a lot of people just kicked the can down the road with East Jerusalem and thought to themselves, oh, one day they're not gonna be our headache. One day is gonna be part of a Palestinian state. Why are we bothering? But Zev Elkin said, no, no, no. East Jerusalem is part of Jerusalem. There's no East and West, it's one city, but we have to actually um, even the playing field between East and West in order for, pe for it to look like one city and feel like one city. And so I was very proud to run with him. Unfortunately, he didn't win. Uh, and there, two, there were two rounds of voting. And in the second round, I supported the current mayor, which was lucky for me. Uh, and that's how I got this position. There's also a little bit of luck involved in politics. And thankfully, I backed the right horse eventually. Um, so that's how I got involved in politics. I, uh, you asked me if I, I look, I'm, at the moment, I'm completely dedicated to Jerusalem. There's so much work to do. Unfortunately, we're the poorest city in the country, even though we're the bigger, we're the capital city of the country, because the two largest minorities in the country live in the largest numbers in our city, which is the ultra-Orthodox and the Arabs. And so at the moment, what we're trying to do is really uh, work very hard to develop the city economically and to give equal opportunities to all the populations. We're the most diverse city, and I believe it's part of our DNA. Uh, you know, I always say that when King David, 3,000 years ago, you know, picked Jerusalem to build the capital of his kingdom, he picked Jerusalem because it didn't belong to any one tribe. We were between Judah and Benjamin. We didn't belong to any one tribe. And so the DNA from the very beginning of the existence of Jerusalem has been one of a place where all tribes can come and gather. And so it's very important for me that every Jew around the world should see themselves in Jerusalem and should see Jerusalem as their heart and soul. And so all my efforts at the moment are in that. But indeed, I would love to move at some point to national politics. Um, I'm part of the Likud party. I'm a central committee member. And hopefully one day I'd like to run in the primaries for the Knesset. And from there, who knows? Wishing you nothing but, but all of the best, uh, of course, in the future. But like you said, you have a full plate right now and a lot of very important work that you're doing. Uh, and uh, I think uh, to be laser focused on the work that you have right now is certainly the best thing uh, for Jerusalem Absolutely. and for Israel and for the future of all of our people. So uh, 
thank you from the bottom of my heart uh, for, for what you're doing and uh, for the future yeah. of the people. Yeah. Um, so we have a couple, a couple minutes left here. We're going to uh, open it up for a couple questions. And I, I believe I see that my, my friend Steve Feldman from Philadelphia uh, has his hand raised. Uh, Steve, could you please unmute your mic and, and go ahead and answer, ask your question? Thank you very much, Brian. Uh, great program, uh, everybody. Uh, my question is for the deputy mayor. You mentioned uh, the economic issues and websites and or merchants in Jerusalem. Is there a directory online that we can all go to, uh, buy things from Jerusalem businesses and boost the company? Yes, that would be fantastic. At the moment, I believe it's only in Hebrew, which I'm trying to get translated now to English. Um, it's called JMOL. The, I'm trying to see if I can get a an address for you and I'll, I'll find the address and I'll put it on the chat. It's general um, and it's basically got most, here we are, JMall online. You can send it to us. We'll be happy to send it to all of the participants. Wonderful. I'll put it on the, I'll put it, I'll send it to you. I'll put it on the chat. Great. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Steve, thank you for the question. And uh, next we will go to Carl Goldberg. Carl, could you please unmute and ask your question? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Great, thank you. I first want to express my profound gratitude to the ZOA and all of uh, uh, the organizers of this webinar also. I think it's the greatest Jewish organization going in America. Uh, now, a uh, question for Mayor Fleur, if you'd be so kind. Uh, describe what the Arab leaders in Jerusalem are doing to encourage the Arab population to feel themselves at home in a united Jerusalem under Israeli sovereignty. What are they doing to uh, essentially bring in their own Arab communities into the Israeli community? Uh, very short answer, and that's nothing, because <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's, no, there's no leadership in East Jerusalem, not really. Um, you have some spiritual leadership, you have community leadership. The Arabs of East Jerusalem, or as somebody mentioned on the chat, Eastern Jerusalem, is difficult. I actually say the Arab community of Jerusalem, and I don't give it a geography, but never mind. You know, 40% of East Jerusalem is Jewish. 40% of the population in East Jerusalem is Jews, but that's another story. Um, they, the, one of the main problems is that there's no leadership, and one of the reasons for that is that, oh, thank you, Alan, for the JMO thing. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is that they don't vote in uh, local elections. They can vote, they could vote, but they choose not to vote because for them, it's a statement on sovereignty. Uh, and so because they're in this very kind of uh, delicate position, they don't vote. So two, 3% vote. So we actually, in city council, we don't have one Arab representative, which I think is bad because if they did, it would be much better. We would be on our way to normalization and they would actually have some legitimate representation in, you know, in the municipal institution. Um, the good news is that two Arabs run for city hall for the first time. One came close. His name is Ramadan Dawash. He's a great guy. He's a Zionist. He's a Likud member. And so you do have a lot of Arabs who are now saying, we are very happy to be part of this city. The problem is there's no real leadership. And I actually have a lot of sympathy for them because they're very threatened by Hamas groups and, um, and by Palestinian Authority groups Fatah groups in the city. So they are a little bit between a rock and a hard place. They're threatened, they're intimidated, and I don't blame them. And so what we really need to be doing, because they have a lack of leadership, is kicking out these extreme groups from our city. And I have to add one more thing. The latest in the last few years, an uh, infiltrator of our city are the Turkish, the Turks through different nonprofit organizations. They're trying to get a hold of the city. They're giving free scholarships to the students of East Jerusalem, and it's very problematic. 
So I'm going to be starting in the next coming year to do a campaign to try and get rid of the Turkish non-profits organizations, as well as UNRWA, which is the United Nations Relief and Workers Association, which both of them, in all their educational programs, are teaching incitement, anti-Semitism, de delegitimization, and an obsession with the right of return, which of course we all know the right of return means the annihilation of the Jewish people in our homeland. And so this is something the government has to deal with. And I'm working very closely with the Likud ministers in government, uh, the ones in the security cabinet, to try and figure out ways to get them out of our city. And I can assure you, ZOA and through ZOA Israel, we will support that effort and promote it when it comes to, to it. it's the starting line. Thank you, Mark. Carl, thank you very much for that question. Uh, before I turn it back uh, to Mark here for closing remarks, uh, I want to say thank you to, again, for, for making the time uh, to join us on today. Thank you, Mark, uh, for, for, for filling in for Mort. Uh, really was looking forward to having Mort on the line. Uh, such a fierce and, and strong leader for the Jewish people, and uh, we're just so lucky to have people like Mort and Mark and Natalie and Alan and so many others at ZOA that are fighting the good fight, um, you know, for the future of the Jewish people, not just in Israel, but throughout the world. So on that note, I will say, I'm Yisrael al Chai, and I will turn it over to Mark uh, for closing remarks. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we, we've had a very interesting, enjoyable hour here. Floor, I want to thank you again, dear friend of ours, dear personal friend. We're delighted to have you. We look forward to hosting you in New York in our beautiful ZOA headquarters at 3rd Avenue and 41st Street when this pandemic ends. We certainly invite everyone on this webinar. We have a beautiful headquarters offices. We'll be running, uh, we'll continue with our programs once we're out of the pandemic. We hope to see you live. I want to again thank Natalie and Alan and the rest of our staff, Jackie, for helping to put this together. Thank Brian, ZOA, you know, you're all with us. We stand with us. We have your contact info. You know, we, we love support, both support in person, support on these programs, and of course, financial support. So, you know, please keep ZOA in mind uh, on that front. Uh, we obviously have significant challenges during this pandemic that like all nonprofits, but we, we are committed to our work. Uh, I'll share with Mort this wonderful, wonderful program we had and the terrific number of people that we've had stayed on it throughout. Floor again, thank you. Brian, thank you. And I wish everyone a safe, uh, happy, and healthy day. Thank you all. Thank you.